Hello. I'm Dr. Mary Bryson, Director of the Public Humanities Hub. I'm delighted to welcome you to this exciting event. I'd like to acknowledge that our event today takes place on the unceded ancestral lands of the Musqueam, dispossessed lands. Wherever you're located on Zoom, likely there's an important connection between those lands, colonialism, and the work that we're doing here today. This event is a collaborative production between the Public Humanities Hub, the Dean's Offices of the Faculty of Education and the Faculty of Arts, the Office of Equity and Inclusion, and the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice. Special thanks to the Hub staff who work tirelessly to make events happen. Why this event for us, the Public Humanities Hub? The Eurocentric humanities and conceptions of the human are inextricably bound up in and produced by racial logics of ubiquitous whiteness, an unbearable straightness of being gendered, conditions for a belligerently anti-Black world, and more. The Public Humanities Hub Noted Scholar Lecture Series is dedicated to showcasing academic engagement that seeks to rethink, collaboratively curate, vociferously champion imaginative styles of world making, agitate to secure and redistribute access to disordered forms of being, knowledge, and the conditions of belonging, indeed of survival itself amongst a very broad set of publics, including most particularly communities historically and persistently marginalized. To introduce Dr. Walcott, Dr. Peter James Hudson, Department of Geography, deploying the methodologies and literatures of Black Studies, Political Economy and History, Dr. Hudson's research examines the long histories of Black dispossession under capitalism, and of Black resistance to capitalist dispossession. Dr. Peter James Hudson is the author of Bankers and Empire, How Wall Street Colonized the Caribbean. Dr. Hudson, over to you. Thank you uh, for the introduction and welcome everybody. <clears throat> and uh, friends, comrades, colleagues, welcome to Black History Month. Um, I'd like to start by saying that today's event is historic. Um, it's not historic, even though for perhaps the first time in the University of British Columbia's history, two black men are sharing the stage and the event. I mean, though that is indeed something, but that's not the reason why we're here or why it's, it's historic. I think it's historic because we are about to hear from someone, um, I'm sure, and learn from someone, Professor Ronaldo Walcott, who is truly a Canadian national treasure. Now, I say that knowing full well that Ronaldo has throughout his work rejected the idea of the nation as a frame of reference. And I say that knowing full well that Ronaldo was not someone who would view his work through the lens of sentimentalism or nostalgia or assess it in terms of accolades or awards. Yet perhaps paradoxically, it is for these stances, anti-national and against nostalgia, but also anti-disciplinary, anti-authoritarian, anti-institutional, and ultimately for a radical intellectual political freedom and emancipation, that Ronaldo, Ronaldo's work should be studied and his voice needs to be heard and I would suggest cherished. But who is Ronaldo Walcott? Well, here are the basics. Well, professor Ronaldo Walcott is professor and chair of African American Studies at the University of Buffalo in Buffalo, New York, where he holds the Carl V. Granger Chair in Africana and American Studies. He is a writer and critic whose research is in the area of Black diaspora cultural studies, gender and sexuality with interests in nations, nationalism, multiculturalism, policy and education broadly defined. He has published in a wide range of venues on everything from literature to film, to theater, to music, to policy. His articles have appeared 
in scholarly journals and books, as well as newspapers and magazines and media online sources. He often comments on black cultural life for radio and TV. Walcott is the author of the path-breaking and pioneering Black Like Who, Writing Black Canada, which has gone through multiple editions. He's also the author of Queer Returns, Essays on Multiculturalism, Diaspora, and Black Studies, and co-author of Black Life, Post-Black Lives Matter and the Struggle for Freedom. In 2021, Walcott published The Long Emancipation, Moving Toward Freedom, and On Property, Policing Prisons and the Call for Abolition, which was nominated for the Heritage Toronto Book Award, long listed for the Toronto Book Awards, a Globe and Mail Book of the Year, and listed in CBC Books Best Canadian Nonfiction of 2021. Walcott has also edited or co-edited multiple works including rude contemporary Black Canadian cultural criticism. Now, what do all these annotations actually mean in terms of Rinaldo's importance and influence? Let me suggest a few things. Rinaldo was among the first scholars who served as a conduit for British cultural studies, and in particular, Black British cultural studies into Canadian scholarly discourse. He was one of the earliest people to theorize the concept of diaspora within the Black Canadian context, and by doing so, enabled us to think about Black Canada outside of a purely nationalist frame or as something overdetermined by either African American or Caribbean intellectual and cultural influence. Rinaldo was an early and public critic of certain regressive forms of Black nationalism for its uh, vulgar masculinist biases, its bad gender politics, and its terrible homophobia. He was one of the earliest scholars to write critically about Black popular culture in Canada, including Black Canadian film, visual art, and hip hop. Rinaldo was theorizing Black geography long before Black geography was a thing. And take a look, for example, at his essay, A Tough Geography Towards a Poetic of Black Spaces, published in his Black Like, like Who. Rinaldo has also consistently made difficult stances look easy consistently rejecting and critiquing many of the received intellectual and political tropes we have be, been, bequeathed, uh, uh, been bequeathed by the state, by the university, and by the market, be it ideas of multiculturalism, the fetishization of representational politics, the embrace of nationalism, or the, na the notion of celebration as a so-called critical trope for studying Black popular culture. And Ronaldo has been a teacher and mentor and inspiration for many of us over many many years dating back to a time when a black professor was much rarer than it is now and especially one who was not only tuned into the latest intellectual currents and visible in the public world but one who also carried himself with verve style and a consistent sartorial sharpness moreover while ronaldo has been maintained a certain insistent irreverence he has also remained ethically uncompromised now, on a personal note, I've known Ronaldo for a few decades now, first through his writing, later in person. He was someone who made it possible uh, for me to think of myself as a scholar long before I entered graduate school. And I've been fortunate enough to have uh, edited his work on a number of times. The first time was in 1997 for a special issue of Roy Meekie's West Coast Line. The issue was called North New African Canadian Writing. And we published Wal Walcott's A Tough Geography essay knowing full well that we had in our hands a very special piece of writing. But there is another, perhaps more profound, if perhaps more ephemeral or more submarine connection I'd like to point to. And it's a connection that I think brings all of us here together in the deep currents of black history and a connection I think that needs to be urgently nurtured here in Vancouver and at, U at UBC. Now, now, Ronaldo currently teaches at the Department of African American Studies at the University of Buffalo. That was where I had my first academic job uh, in that department more than a decade ago. Um, and more significantly, that department has a long tie to Canada and specifically Vancouver. It was founded in 1969 by a graduate of the University of British Columbia, by the Trinidadian historian Hollis Ralph Lynch. Lynch completed an honors BA in history at UBC in 1960 writing an award-winning thesis on Sir Joseph Trutch. And when we talk about land acknowledgments, we have to acknowledge Joseph Trutch, who, as we all know, was one of the architects of indigenous displacement in British Columbia. And he also came from a slaveholding family in Jamaica. So those black indigenous connections uh, land right here. Now, after writing, uh, this is Hollis Lynch again, his thesis on a white settler colonialist, Lynch wanted to research the history of Pan-Africanism. In 1959, while living at 3840 West 20th Street, 
he wrote to W.E.B. Du Bois asking for advice on where and how to study Pan-Africanism and how to find the money to fund it. Du Bois wrote back with a few suggestions and stated, of course, Vancouver would be a little far afield for study on Africa. Lynch left Vancouver and UBC and went on to study at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, where he wrote a dissertation on the great Pan-Africanist Edward Wilmot Blyden. He later landed at Roosevelt University before being recruited to Buffalo. Yet a question remains 60 years later, is Vancouver still a little far afield for the study of Africa? Is it a little far afield for black studies? Or do students have to follow Professor Lynch and Professor Walcott across the border to Buffalo and beyond to do that work? And just as important, what should that work look like? Ronaldo Walcott's entire career gives us a great example of how that black studies work should be done. And I'm sure his talk today will provide a historic marker, marker for black studies at UBC. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ronaldo Walcott and please listen closely to his words. I did this associate. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Professor Bryson, for extending this invitation to the Humanities Hub and for hosting me here this afternoon. Um, I told Professor Hudson that I was going to disassociate um, when he introduced me, and I did. <laughs> so I don't know what he said, but <laughs> don't believe much of it. Um, it's just, it's, it's a, um, an honor and a privilege to be here with you and to see old friends. Um, Professor Bryson is still as sharp and as fierce as ever. Um, it's making me think of the, of the mid to late 90s and all the work that was being done in education and queer studies and critical pedagogy and the intense fiery debates around, around those questions when I first met you through Deborah Britzman and, and others. <laughs> and Peter, I first met Peter through a little magazine. Did you call it a magazine or we called it a zine then? Diaspora. Diaspora. He used to publish a little magazine called Diaspora. That's how I first met him. This thing would circulate across Canada in really interesting ways. And then one day he showed up in Toronto <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I met him in person. And um, the, the, the one thing I'll, I'll say about um, Professor Hudson now is, I'm glad that he's not in the history department anymore, <laughs> that he's now in something like geography because his intellectual purview is so capacious that when he told me that he was gonna be a historian, I was so upset because I was like, <laughs> I wanna hear Peter on cultural expression. I wanna hear Peter on music, on film, on art, all of which he used to do before. I want him out of the archives <laughs> and into the streets, but he's also an amazing, amazing historian and a particular, your work on banking and, and, and Canada has been profoundly inspirational for me because it helps me to find a way back to the Caribbean as well. And uh, it's, it's profound work. So I have a lot to say and not enough time. So if things get choppy or, or, or if we run out of time, I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> you might not hear everything. But I wanna begin um, my talk with um, a number of guide quotes. I want you to understand that there's no news talking about black studies unless you make it perfectly clear that the wealth which enabled the bourgeoisie to challenge those who were in charge of society and to institute the power building industrial regime came from slavery, the slave trade, and the industries which were based upon that. CLR James, Black Studies and the Contemporary Student. Wherever he goes, the Negro remains a Negro. Franz Fanon, black skin, white mass. The present phase of black studies has co-opted the mainstream and redefined it as a multicultural or ethnically based African-American studies. In its initial phase, however, the call for black studies joined with calls for a series of other non-white studies, American Indian, the red, 
Chicanos, Asians, as well as for feminist studies to constitute a systemic challenge to the truth of our present order of knowledge by revealing this truth to be true only from a normative perspectival standpoint defined by specific characteristics. Sylvia Winter, Columbus, the ocean blue and fables that stir the mind. <clears throat> Hundreds of years after, make, after the making of its neo origins, these Canadians and Americans who police these fresh borders, materially as well as intellectually, play and dwell in the language of conquest. Dion Brand, a map to the north, a map to the door of no return. In 1969, the Barbadian-born Black Canadian Austin Clark found himself at Yale University in the thick of the Black activist movement sweeping the USA, and more specifically, the call for the institutionalization of Black studies. Clark would find himself as visiting professor and writer teaching Black Studies courses to some of the fields present, luminaries, for example, like Henry Louis Gates Jr. as undergraduates. This anecdote serves as a kind of orienting cautionary tale of how we might date Black Studies in Canada. In a strange twist of events, one might say that Black Studies in Canada began with Clark's forays at Yale and even at the University of Texas at Austin, where he went after in the late 60s and early 70s. Clark's participation in the founding of Black Studies in the US is an important part of the diaspora character of Black Studies from its inception, from its earliest inception. And indeed, the first chair of Black Studies at Yale was a guy called Bryce, um, Bryce Laporte, who was a Panamanian. And um, he and Austin stayed in touch over the years. Um, and um, Austin shared with me um, a lot of the kinds of energy and excitement and tension and the kinds of debates that went into constituting Black Studies at that moment. Indeed, the diasporic foundation of Black Studies is often concealed in service of more nationally bound histories. And one understands that the seduction of these bounded histories when Black, black Studies is deployed as a means towards national inclusion that Black studies did not officially take hold in Canada in the late 1960s and 70s tells us a story of the Canadian nation state and its relation to Blackness too. It might be important to know that the long delay towards Black studies in Canada is symptomatic, I believe, of a deeper denial and malaise towards Black people and Blackness as, constitu as constitutive of Canada and Canadianness. It is in part, it is in part this relation to Blackness that this paper or this talk explores through a sym symptomatic reading of some moments that might be instructive for Black Studies project in Canada that is not reduced to a diversity and inclusion project. So more than 50 years after Black Studies entered the institution of the university in the USA, Black Studies is now entering the Canadian Academy in a formal way. Of course, Black Studies had already been in and on Canadian campuses since the late 1960s, and even in more organized form, if not recognized from the mid 1970s and onwards. The distinction that we must make is that Black Studies in Canada until recently had no institutional home. As I have said repeatedly, Black Studies has had to be smuggled into the Canadian Academy continually. Nonetheless, this smuggling was not always on the ground. It was sometimes quite explicit. In 1995, I applied for a tenure stream academic position at York University, advertised with a heading that asked for a specialist in Black North American Studies or Latina Latino Studies in North America. The advertisement was explicit in its call for Black Studies. It was not a fugitive call. Indeed, this call could only be as, be as explicit as it was because people like Russell Chase, Jerry Ginsburg, David Trotman, Ato Sekioto, and particularly Leslie Sanders were already doing black studies at York University under the rubric of other names. So they were smuggling in certain kinds of ways. I then taught black studies, I then taught black studies courses from 1995 to 2001 when I left York for the University of Toronto. So the idea that black studies is new in the institution is one that is subtended by a history that has not yet, as far as I know, been officially written down. Indeed, my undergraduate years, 
were a series of courses that pursued the Black worlds of Africa, the Caribbean, South and Central America, and North America, with stops in Black Britain. These courses largely, but not exclusively, taught into interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary departments of humanities division and social science division, as they were named at York University then, functioned as an unofficial Black studies education. And while no one called it Black studies then, as a proper name, we were fully aware that we were studying Africa and its diaspora. Of course, Caribbean and Latin American studies and African studies as official programs existed and were well established at the time of my undergraduate studies in the mid 1980s. And some of those courses I took were listed in those programs, but those programs understood themselves as having very bounded borders. By the time I was first heard at York, Black Studies was more explicit, if not officially named as a program. Leslie Sanders in particular would have supervised a number of undergraduates, masters and doctoral students in Black Studies projects by that time. And it is true that in the absence of Black Studies in Canada at the official level, that Black Studies also retained an important presence in Saturday schools, community meeting places, especially those where politics was heatedly debated and post-colonial desires plotted and in other extra academic spaces where Black people shared knowledge about our lives. For me in Toronto, it was, for me in Toronto, it was third world books and crafts on Bathurst Street, a place where I have ambivalent feelings, but also sentimental memories of, which made Black studies an urgent political reality for me. So I begin with the personal and I will likely bounce back and forth to it as a way to say something about the manner in which black studies produces an intellectual life that is worth considering. An intellectual life that is buttressed by a profound sense that knowledge and its making is an essential element of and for producing a just world. If such a world is even possible. So I hold no degrees that say I study black studies and none of the institutions I attended had black studies programs at the time that I studied there. And yet I would say my legitimacy as a black studies scholar has never been in doubt or question. And furthermore, I have not always since 1995 named myself as a black studies scholar. This is why I use this idea of smuggling. So why is this? The question of legibility in the Canadian Academy is acute in this regard. As a graduate student, I first named myself as an anti as named myself as in anti-racism studies until I recognized the limits of that paradigm for fully studying Black life in Canada. I then turned to cultural studies as Peter Intone as a signifier because it was the designation where I could find critical scholarship and scholars whose intellectual questions seemed to meet some of my own. Later, I adjusted to the Black diaspora studies then critical Canadian studies, multicultural studies, after reading and thinking deeply with Black British scholars. And then later I settled more firmly on Black diaspora cultural studies, sometimes adding social justice when I was a junior Canada research chair of cultural studies and social justice. All these names served to smuggle what I actually did into the Canadian Academy and to make it legible to the academic scene here, the study of Black Canadian life as that study might help to work to unravel the profound consequences of the entire structure of the post-Columbus world. As you can see, my education and maturity as a Black Studies scholar was one achieved against the absence of institutionality. In the initial moments of my studies, despite what I read and what I taught, and the scholars who at the time were fundamentally rearranging the humanities and social sciences in deeply profound ways, Black studies was still largely left felt to be a paradigm of study wholly associated with the USA. In fact, while researchers like Peggy Bristow were for years prior uncovering the history of Black Ontario as a research officer at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, where I did my graduate work, or Leslie Sanders had been teaching Black writers since the 1970s at York University, or Jerry Ginsburg, African American history, or Russell Chase, Black Diaspora Literature and Criticism, or David Trotman teaching Caribbean history and Afro-Caribbean permutations, the Black Diaspora as examples. The language of Black studies in Canada remained almost incohate. 
So my quixotic account here does not even begin to account for the multiple histories that took Black life in Canada as the theme of their work here. I think of Robin Winks's work, deeply flawed, but nonetheless remains deeply important, and Jim Walker, the historian. So what is this Black studies that I'm speaking of? For me, Black studies is less a feel and more a project. It's an intellectual project concerned with liberation. Because liberation is central to Black studies, then not every study of Black people amongst the Black studies. Black studies is not disciplinarily bound. And Black studies is not an instrument to reform the already established and profoundly anti-Black disciplines. Black studies is not an inclusion and diversifying tool. Black studies, like cultural studies in its best formulation, is an anti-disciplinary liberatory project concerned to overthrow the Eurocentric order of knowledge that currently governs our globe. And brutally so. Black studies is more than the study of Black populations. It is instead a challenge to what we think we know about Black people. And therefore, Black studies calls into question the entire Euro-American view of the world that presently organizes most of global life. The very best Black studies calls, for your, calls the your American view of the world into disrepute. As a radical reorientation to knowledge, knowing and meaning, Black studies then seeks to re-narrate and reinvent the world anew. Not from the desire for Black domination, but towards a world without forms of domination. As you can immediately intone then, Black studies has a profound critique of the university as an institution and how the university's legitimacy is deployed in the larger world. In this sense then, Black studies is a movement or a project as African-American political scientist Mike, Michael Hunter taught me years ago. Sylvia Winter writing of, black, of how Black studies made its immediate push on the university summed it up this way. She's writing up three moments, but she says, all three moments have been moved to action by, 19, by the 1968 murder of Martin Luther King Jr. and by the toll of burning in the cities and angry riots that followed in its wake. These events were particularly decisive for the Black Studies movement. The new willingness of mainstream university administrators to accede to the student activist demands for the setting up of Black Studies programs and departments was made possible by the trauma that gripped the nation, the trauma of King's murder. Indeed, the unfolding of Black studies in Canada is in part due to yet another trauma that gripped people around the world in 2020. That trauma of our time was the brutal murder of George Floyd. If the official establishment of Black studies finds its origin in the Floyd trauma, then, then it would be necessary that Black studies is not subordinated in the university to the site of a diversifying project. In fact, I would argue that after 50 years of Black studies in the USA, that the neoliberal university has now realized that its disciplinary mechanisms can indeed discipline Black studies enough to make it conform to the conservative terrain that the university actually is. Thus, the emergence of Black studies in Canada is not a benevolent gift, but rather it, but it's rather in part, but sorry, Thus, the emergence of Black studies in Canada is not a benevolent gift, but rather it, it is in part, but not totally, a demobilizing gift. The betrayal of Black studies project or movement is to truncate it to the disciplinary mechanism of the university. By this, I mean that the Black studies new official incorporation into the Canadian Academy can work to make less urgent a radical transformation of the academic institution itself and other institutions of our social arrangements. But does it mean that we should reject this gift? No, but we must be clear about its limitations. And most importantly, we must be clear about how the university as an institution continually works against collectivity in service of producing individual recognition and reward. Such recognition and reward functions as a structure of legitimacy that individuals desire, but for which, but for which the scarcity of it is never enough to go around. In this way, then incorporation into the university is a way to ration the distribution of what is claimed to be limited resources, 
this ration is one it's this ration is one way in which the the keeping separate of forms of knowledge as in the disciplines is used to prevent forms of forms of cohabitation that would otherwise form towards a significant block for the overthrow of the institution because black studies is a project of liberation or liberations a movement for liberation it is a form of study that confronts the political arrangements of our lives and if normative institutions seek to embrace it we should be alert to the manner in which such appropriations are taking place so we might keep ahead of interrupting so we might keep ahead of in having our movements interrupted as josh myers put it in his recent book of black study and i quote and so here black study means that tradition of refusal of the knowledge of the world as it is given to us by those committed to colonial and racial order and all the ways we still experience it, the many other practices it generates. It is refusal of the blessings of liberal humanism and its variants, the philosophy of life and living that is really only about the political same, a violent reanimation of the status quo, the Western conceptions of what has and should always be. It is in refusing that we created black study as the places in the margins and contently so that challenge everything the university handed down to us as the only possible reality and quote black studies then is a as a project is not a desire to be incorporated into the status quo but inter but to entirely transform into something other than itself and what i'm offering you in my assessment here is an ambivalent perspective on top-down black studies in which it is likely being deployed to interrupt what would like to be more radical demands. And yet my position is not one that simply argues for the refusal of black studies entering the Canadian Academy. Rather, my position is one that wants to call attention to conditions, histories and practices that are attendant to black studies arrival. One example we might look to is women's studies. So in the Sylvia Winter quote, she note that she makes it this, she says feminist studies, which is very different from women's studies. We talk about women's studies as this kind of representative discipline. And I just came from Toronto where we were celebrating 50 years of the Women and Gender Studies um, program and department at U of T. One example we might look to is women's studies. 50 years, 50 plus years of women's studies found around the same time as Black Studies, has now seen women's studies fully incorporated into the Canadian academic institution. The Social Sciences and Humanities Council has women's studies as an established research category. The same cannot be said for Black Studies. It's, SHRC does not have a Black Studies category of research, um, but universities now have Black Studies scholars. I, I wonder about that for evaluations of various kinds. In the context of SHRC, Black studies remains fugitive and is still smuggling into the funded research space. This is not to say that SHRC does not fund black studies projects, I want to be clear, but rather that SHRC's lack of an explicit black studies category says quite a lot about black studies in Canada 50 years later. The affective and effective suppression of blackness in Canada means that the incorporation of black studies in Canada will be greeted with a kind of intellectual hiccup that will likely replicate the trauma that gave rise to it in the first instance. I'm cautious about domestication that is in progress. On the other hand, the Black Studies movement in Canada too will have to account for its own relation to the larger scholarly, to the larger scholarly institution. Let me be a bit more pointed in my observation because I do believe that in the new rush for Black Studies in Canada, there's actually something at stake. Theorizing Black life from outside the US, not as an anti-African American gesture as many people like to do by saying, oh, I'm talking about the international Black people, as though you know, African Americans are not part of an international world. Um, so theorizing Black life from outside the US, not as an anti-African American gesture, but as a mode of making sense of how similar practices land differently in different geographies is crucial for a Black Studies project that seeks to produce a different order of knowledge and eventually another world. That is to puncture the world we now have so new modes of invention become possible. Black studies should be attuned to the geographies of its utterance. Black studies as a movement always has a geography. Its geography is always somehow wrapped up with the location of its practice. 
So while many Black Studies departments will make claims about the nature of their formation, some claiming to be international, others nationally bound, others diasporic, and yet others centering Africa to jettison the place of your location is for me suspect. And while the argument that I am making is for a Black Studies that is conscious about the geography that it proceeds from, that Black Studies is also diasporic in its scope and intentions. Geography in this instance is not a limit. I'm cutting and pasting as I go along, so you're going to get those. <laughs> it's not a limit. Geography is, is, is Black Studies necessary modesty to riff off a of Stuart Hall. A Black Studies that does not nod to its nationally local geography is a Black Studies engaged in some kind of deception, some kind of political project that stalls at liberation, no matter how scholarly and theoretically fluent its grammarians might be. And by that, I really mean that, you know, people who claim to engage in a Black Studies that has no relationship to the communities that the institution is embedded in are engaged in a project that is limited in its scope around questions of what might be necessary um, for liberation. I know I'm getting close to time, so. I have these three examples that I really wanna talk about, but I'll probably try and talk through them a little bit. Um, the first example is the work that the Black artist um, Camille Turner has been doing um, with her um, Afronautic Lab, which is Camille Turner has been engaged in this project where she's been trying to think through what it means to recall and recall the history of slavery on the East Coast of Canada, but also to tie that to the future of Black life in this place. And she's done a number of performances and a number of archival, tactical, kinetically engaged projects that really open up the history of, of slavery and Canada's relationship to slavery out on the East Coast. And very much related to that project, these are the three symptomatic moments that I can't read them because we'll run out of time and you have to go and, and stuff like that. I don't want to bore you that much. But the three examples really fall in and out of each other. Um, so there's, there's, and the, the, you can look, you can look this up on the web and see particularly the performance that I'm thinking of, which is her 2019 Bonavista Biennale, Biennale performance um, staged at the Mock Bagger Plantation site in, in Newfoundland. So she's returning or returning to us the kind of haunting of the Blacks of, of, of slavery in Canada. And um, in doing that, Camille is really kind of opening up this very interesting problem of how Canada remembers, makes sense out, and is formed by a, present, a presence and history of slavery that also in, deeply is implicated in Canada's shipbuilding industry. Um, so that's one moment. The other symptomatic moment that I try to think away from think about in this paper is actually um, Professor Hudson's work on Canadian banking and the way in which um, Professor Hudson's work alerts us to a set of questions around um, how it is that Canada's imperialism actually works through logics of, of, of banking and, the, and, and how those logics of banking bring along with them particular kinds of discourses of race and particularly whiteness that seek to subordinate black people in place, whether we're looking at Canadian banks in Barbados, Trinidad and elsewhere that Professor Hudson has looked at. And the third one that I work with is the question of the history of COD and its own implication in the feeding of um, enslaved people in the Caribbean. But what those three examples do is they fall back into each other to offer us a really robust understanding of Canada's world in the slavehold in Atlantic. And, and why it is that I've argued in this paper, I kind of talk about it a little bit by 
by um, George Grant's Lament for a Nation. It's the candlelights to deny that it doesn't know much about Black people until post-World War II. But what all three of these examples show is that Canada actually has a very robust understanding and story of Black people. <laughs> and that robust understanding and story of Black people is the denial of its own place in Atlantic slavery. And if so, a Black Studies project that, and these are just three moments that I'm particularly interested in. There are many, many others. I mean, we can talk about the, the St. Lawrence Seaway and its own relationship all the way back to the Caribbean and what that means, even via this story of cod, right? Um, the point here is that a Black studies that is attentive to its geography will begin to rewrite the narrative of what it is we think we know about, about Canada. And that these are three, three points and three moments um, where we can begin to do that. But I feel like I should move towards um, concluding so that we can have some kind of conversation. So I'll just say, uh, you know, one paragraph. <laughs> Let's let me get through all this stuff on Cod and John Talon Market. Anybody ever go to John Talon Market in, in Montreal? If you go to John Talon Market in Montreal, you will see the visibility of this history of Cod. Uh, Mark Kolansky in his book, Cod, um, The Biography of a Fish, um, is the first person who alerted me to it, but you can actually still go there today and see it. If you go to John Talon, you see two kinds of codfish. You see lovely, beautiful, thick cuts of cod. And then you see the spiny, really tanned, dried, salted cod. The thick cuts are the, are the cuts that used to be sent to Portugal and that the Portuguese continue to buy and to work with for their bacalao. The thin, salty, almost look like it should be discarded. It's the one that Caribbean people knew, that Black Caribbean people knew, that comes directly from slavery. So even visually, you can, you can see the story being told right now today in 2024 in, in, in Montreal. So because I couldn't read the, 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 the denseness of, of what I tried to do with those three examples, but just let me say this. What I'm trying to do here through the trace of the historical is to set out the logic for reading Canada that refuses the terms of the frames that Canada has offered up for us to access it and therefore analyze it. I call this reading a symptomatic reading insofar as I've been offering you multiple examples from the archive of Canada's place in the slave generated and invented Atlantic world that are constitutive of the anti-Black rot that animates Canadian social, political and cult cultural life and its imaginary life and therefore its national consciousness. Sylvia Winter in On How We Mistook the Map for the Territory in recounting the struggle for Black studies in the USA argues that in its institutionalization and thus defeat, it was unable to, and I quote her, to complete, the, to complete intellectual that emancipation quote that it had inaugurated. Winter argues and points out how liberal humanism and partial induction into the ethno class of the West undermined and led to the confusing territory for the map and led to undermine and led to confusing the territory for the map. That's what EDI does, undermines and confuses <laughs> and leads to the, the territory for the map. For example, Black Studies became, quote, she says, re-territorialized and ethnicized as African-American studies, as opposed to a larger global formation. So pretty soon we will be talking in Canada only of uh, Black Canadian studies as opposed to Black studies. Are we heading towards an ethnicized African Canadian studies with its attendant gatekeepers? In fact, in some instances we are, we're beginning to see that emerge. Most recently, I saw a session that was titled The Past and Future of Black Studies. Um, hosted by the Black Studies Association. And it was really interesting because most of the people who understood themselves to have been the past of Black Studies were actually people who described their work previously as anti-racism. But in this moment where Black Studies is a diversifying project, those people have now remade themselves as Black Studies, which is fine. People, scholars remake themselves all the time. That's okay, but there's an interesting narrative there that I think we have to think with. Are we heading towards an exercise? African Canadian Studies with its attendant gatekeepers, We've had those exchanges before, <laughs> anyhow. Okay, let me conclude. Last sentence. 
I'm suggesting that EDI works and functions in a similar fashion to three territorialized, more radical black demands, while leaving the map still in the hands of Western bourgeois men as if human, a category that the black can never fully enter, and it is the work of black studies to destroy. Alas, black studies in contemporary Canada has a work cut out for it, if it is to destroy that order of knowledge. Thank you. If it's on, can people hear me? We're good, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for, for the talk. I, I gotta say, I've read the talk. I read the talk last night and I, I wish we could have spent the time <laughs> to get into the kind of granular detail of Camille Turner's work. Uh, we don't need to talk about my work, but also the, the, the work around uh, COD is so important. And I think, you know, as, as you pointed out, I'm, I, I, I've abandoned history for geography. Um, and so I wanna kind of push, or not push you, but ask you some questions about, about geography specifically. Um, because you talked about the importance of the geography of black studies and not jettisoning that. And I think it's obviously important to talk about cod, but also as you point out in the paper about sugar, about rum, about Seagram's, and we can see that geography both in Atlantic Canada, but also with the sugar refineries here in, in, in Vancouver, that, that wasn't all beet sugar, that was cane sugar from the Caribbean. But the question I wanna ask you about geography and place specifically is what is it meant for you uh, pedagogically and methodologically to cross the border, to go from Toronto to Buffalo, following the steps of, of people like Hollis Lynch, but also kind of replicating the work of someone like Rick James, who was between the two, <laughs> the two places, and who talks about that in his biography. That was a great question, Peter. You know, I mean, first, in, as I said, it bounced back to, you know, one of the things that made the possibility of going to UB desirable is its proximity to Toronto. But also, I mean, I began this bit by talking about Austin, Austin Clark. But um, in the 70s, Austin Clark and Barry Callahan, um, they used to go down to the department that I'm current um, to listen to music, to hang out with writers, to engage in conversation with um visual artists and so on the department itself was um a cultural hotbed formation Archie Shep um the great jazz musician had his first teaching job in that department um so knowing a little bit of the history of the department um made 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 it made it an attractive option but it's proximity to Toronto because that's where I've lived most of my life also was a, a, a major factor. But part of what I'm trying to get at is, is that we're in a really interesting moment where after 50 years of uh, black studies in the US, in Europe, in Canada, a bunch of other places, the emergence of black studies programs and degrees and so on has, has have come into their fruition. And when you pay close attention to some of them, as I kind of hinted at, some of them are kind of positioned as a kind of anti-African American gesture. And I really want to refuse that by saying, you know, a powerful liberatory black study is aware of the geography from which it is practicing what it is doing. But at the same time, it is interested in diasporic connection and difference. And so it has to be attuned to its geography and then it has to be attuned to the other geographies where black encounter is possible and where black life happens. And so for me, geography is both about a kind of materiality of the ground that we land in, every diaspora is landed somewhere, but it's also about um, the possibility of the imagination. And, and so geography, um, like metaphors actually really mean something in the sense that you know, the geography of the Black diaspora is not always then about where we're landed, but it's about, you know, what are the kind of effective political connections we can make um, with other Black people around the world. And I get really worried when I see things like, oh, well, 
our black studies program is an international, we do international black studies. We don't do the local type. Well, <laughs> you're landed somewhere. And if the liberatory project of, of black studies is to do something more than simply find its place in the institution, in the university, it means then that some of that something more has to be about. What kind of impact does it have on its own locality? And so that's that's what I'm grappling with. So I just arrived in Buffalo. I've been going into my second year. And I'm really just trying to learn about that community and to find spaces where I can be a part of that community so that the work that I continue to do also is written from that place. Thank you for that. And I, and I, I appreciate it, especially because I think people forget that the history of, of that moment of Black studies in the 60s and 70s is also, you know, in, in the US, it's also a Pan-African moment. I mean, they're, they're looking elsewhere. It also, I think, speaks to the fact that in my experience, uh, studying in the States and working in the States, the African-American community has been so generous in so many ways, intellectually, and, and uh, for a community so besieged to see it so generous is, is incredible. You began the talk uh, uh, evoking Austin Clark, and you just spoke about him right now. Um, you have a long history with Austin. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more personally about that and, and say, well, when did you first encounter Austin as a writer? When did you encounter him as a person? And what does his persona and person mean for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I first encountered <clears throat> Austin as a writer in my undergraduate studies at York University in the 1980s. And um, I didn't, I never met him in person until the 1990s when um, Leslie and the writer and poet Dion Brand introduced me to him. And we quickly became friends. And I think that had something to do with the fact that we were both, both born in the same island in, Bar in the Caribbean, Barbados. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, at a personal level, my friendship with Austin is um, it's an interesting one. <laughs> interesting. I tell my students, don't use interesting. <laughs> it's an interesting one to the extent that uh, it's an interesting one to the extent that um, you know, some people read Austin as a uh, as conservative, and and yes, he did become an official member of um, the yeah the the Conservative Party of Canada. I read him as a kind of complicated Fanoni um, with a, a particular streak of black nationalism. Um, but I think um, what I mean by, by interesting is that, you know, um, Austin is a was a particular kind of black heterosexual man. And we created this great friendship with this, at the time I was younger, younger black gay man. And, you know, we spent tremendous amount of time together um, arguing and debating and, trying to think about um, what it meant to be Black intellectuals in the context of Canada, which is a kind of impossibility, even as it is possible, right? But it's a kind of impossibility. And so, you know, his experience had a profound impact on me to the extent that, you know, the trajectory of Austin Clark's career is one in which, you know, um, out of the gates in about 64 or so, you know, you know, his first novel is really fairly well um, celebrated. And then by the 70s and 80s, he's kind of out of fashion. <laughs> and nobody really knows who he is. And, you know, and he's taking these patronage jobs um, to, you know, work in the refugee court. Or at one point he was on the censor board, right? When my older brother, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk tonight. Yeah, it's, at one point he's on the censor board, right? When Ontario had a censor board. And you know, so far, wow, he's you know out there in the wilderness. And indeed, when he's publishing work, is largely being published by um, Barry Callahan's Press Exile. Um, you know, a bunch of short story collections. Um, when he's really, and then in the 1990s, there's this you know because you're a part of it. There's this great renaissance in this country of black writing and art and filmmaking, and he comes back into vogue. And End of that decade, he wins the Gala Prize and gets celebrated as this kind of older um, black writer and gets celebrated as like the godfather of black Canadian writing and so on. But what all of that 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 later part of life celebration conceals is the is the parts where he's out in the wilderness, where you know he's seen as too angry, um, where he's not read as Canadian literature, 
where he's kind of written off as kind of immigrant literature. And, and that's like this weird, fuzzy category in which, you know, you might get read, you might not get read. And so, you know, his life is instructive around not thinking that institutions can be the site of liberatory politics and a sustaining politics in which, you know, they will fully account for how one shapes the world. So, you know, Austin had in his house this red chair that he just would not cover or get fixed. You know, the seat was sinking in. And the reason he had it, he wouldn't do that is because he had interviewed Malcolm X and Malcolm had sat in that chair. And this was the great meeting of the two black men of North America, right? The Canadian and the US one. And, but you know, that sinking in seat <laughs> is like to me a really profound metaphor of what can happen to black life. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> one thing about Austin I wanna ask you about, when did you and he rec realize or recognize that there was a connection through food? <laughs> So sometime in the late 1990s, yeah, I can tell this story. At a certain point before Austin's work came back into vogue and he was able to write new work as well, he had a traumatic financial experience where he had this on McGill Street in Toronto that he really loved, he hosted and, and entertained people there. And he lost that house. Like one day I was sitting at home and he called me, he said, you gotta come help. The, the marshals, the sheriffs are here. They're gonna put locks on their door. <laughs> like they came and they repossessed the house. And so I used to live on, 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 a, on a street. Gosh, uh, I forgot what it's called. Anyhow, so he lost his house. And he went off to a couple of residency. There were residencies where he could live. And then he met this woman and he moved to Italy for a little while. And then he came back and he bought a house on Sugar Street, which is the last house that he lived. And the house had two apartments. And he lived upstairs and I lived downstairs. I'm, I moved into this house sight on scene with the dumbest thing I ever did, but because <laughs> I needed a lot of work. <laughs> So I was single then and I would cook meals for myself. And Austin, if he was leaving to go out, would look through the window and see me sitting eating my meal by myself. And he thought I was weird. <laughs> and he told me that. He was like, you are so weird. You cook these elaborate meals <laughs> and eat them by yourself. And so I was like, yeah, it's true. I like to cook. And I knew he liked to cook too, but he always entertained. He always had a group. And that's that's how that came to be, you know? <laughs> that's that's beautiful. I want to move it slightly away from the, the personal for a moment and ask a question. Obviously, we're all consumed with the the, the genocide in Gaza right now. And I and I think this is a particular ethical ethical and political issue for black studies. And it seems to me within black studies, there's two things happening, or at least two. But one of them is a kind of Afro-pessimist rejection of solidarity with Gaza. On the other hand, there is the near criminalization of pro-Palestinian speech on university campuses in North America. Where should black studies stand and what kind of projects should black studies take on in this context at this moment? Wow, that's a really big question. But first, I'm going to say that, you know, the kind of black studies that I'm invested in stands for liberation. And it stands, as I said in my paper, it stands for not just putting into this repute um, the Euro, Euro American humanism and liberalism, but it stands for its absolute destruction, right? Like we want a different world, we want a better world, and we know it can't happen under the auspices of Euro American liberalism and humanism. So that kind of black studies is clear where it stands. It stands in relationship to struggling right alongside um, the Palestinians. Uh, but I think in this moment, 
you know, the kinds of subfields that we have seen develop in black studies, whether it's Afro-pessimism or black optimism and so on, that to me, those are the evidence of what I was saying, that the neoliberal university is actually really skilled at managing black studies. The kind of black, that gets managed. Um, they, they might not think that they're being managed, but they're being managed. They're the outcome and the outgrowth of the neoliberal universities insistent that we must constantly invent, invent new categories. And therefore, this is why their contradictions show up at this particular moment. Like, you know, I mean, there's Afro-pessimism, there's Black nihilism, there's like, like we've got all of these smallest subcategories. And I don't think they, I don't think they can be dismissed. I think they have to be grappled with because I think they're a symptom of something deeper and more and 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 more um, troubling. At the same time, I think Afro pessimism, in particular, in its deployment of the language of anti blackness, has given us something useful to work with. And so I don't want to throw throw that out. But what it hasn't given us in a clearly formulated manner is what's the nature of its political project. Mm -hmm see that in this moment around some of the responses um, where you know people are dying um, being murdered bombed, and people are suddenly talking about um, whether or not Palestinians are anti-black yeah. as though they're not black Palestinians right so there, there, there's a kind of misguidedness to to some of the political political rhetoric for me the, the, the kind of black studies that I'm interested in obviously comes from also that long insistence that colonial projects are always the thing that we're working against. And so, you know, it would be easy for me to say James Baldwin and Huey Newton and, and name all of the black figures who have stood alongside um, Palestinian freedom fighters in service of a different kind of world. You know, we don't only have to do that through naming them. We can do that, you know, you, you know that I sometimes tweak quite a bit. And I'm always curious about, you know, people are always quoting, you know, Walter Rodney or they're quoting Du Bois. Or they, and then I'm like, but what are we saying for ourselves now? How are we going to articulate it now? You know, one thing that I take seriously is David Scott in his first book, Refashioning Futures. He kind of posed, he was like, he posed this question around. He's like, if the anti-colonial post-independence um, desires failed, they never were fully able to come to fruition. Um, can we be asking the same questions that they ask, right? So yes, we need to know these histories and we need to understand that we belong to these intellectual and political traditions, but we also have to be able to formulate our own questions in our time. And so that's, and that's where I think we're failing tremendously. I, I appreciate that. I'm also very wary that that even the ideas of black history and black excellence can be used as political covers for certain kind of work. I know um, we're, we're I don't know where we're at with time, but I'd like to open it up for uh, to questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to go with the hands that I see first. So, yeah, let's get it on the mic so that the the, the Zoom world can hear us. Um, hi, my name is um, Viplav. I'm doing my master's in GRSJ, which is the Gender, Race, and Social Justice Institution. Before I ask my question, my one of the professors I work with said, I need to work with you at some point. So I just want to say that I've been aggressively nodding, and I realize why they said that to me, because you just have amazing things to say. Um, I, I wanted to say that it's interesting. Um, initially, I used to think that what is the point in decolonizing from the West? And then I used to think, well, we shouldn't repeat the violence that we're trying to move away from. But where I've come to now question the significance of liberatory action in the academy or beyond is, can we afford such liberation only after conforming to systems that violently define us? And I wanted to see what your take on that is, because it seems like we are conforming to the system and then we're saying, well, now <laughs> it's time to radicalize things. Can, do we need to do that to afford the liberty is the question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I turn to, she never formally taught me, but I, I, I turn to my teacher, Sylvia Winter, on, on this question. I think often what, what, we, what, we think, what we think is being 
as a kind of radical position is really actually a demobilizing position. It's a demobilizing position of representation. So, you know, my offhand comments about EDI and DEI or whatever you call it, that that's a, I, I read those, I read that practice as demobilizing, um, which is to say that in every instance that the institution says, yes, I can give you A, it's because you're actually really asking for D. And D is the much more difficult, transformative um, request and demand. And so you get offered A because A holds the thing in place, right? If, if, you, think, if you think about, you know, let's say the last decade of EDI work, and yeah, I mean, yeah, they're, they're more black professors. There might be more um, queer professors. There might even be a couple of trans professors. But the the reality is the the university's institution still looks the same way that they looked in 1961, <laughs> right? So what's happening? We're being managed by a very particular kind of structure, but we're being told that this is a radical gesture. And so you know, yeah. No, we can't. Liberation, we're within the rift off. We're within and against. And if we're aware of how we're within and against, we also know then that there's a countervailing story, which is what I'm trying to say about Black studies in Canada. There's another account of this life that we're living that we can tell, that would transform things. But that account is often suppressed and discredited, and our struggle is to make that account become the dominant account. Because when we when we make that account the dominant account, it 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 produces the foundation for engaging in the practices that we know that will give all of us the full lives that we that we really desperately need and should have. So that's what I'm after. Um, there and then there and then I see. It. Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I come from Black Studies, one of the oldest Black Studies departments in the US. So I'm so appreciative of so much of what you're saying, but I also wanted to bring in a little bit of the sort of post 2020 moment that's happening in the US and attacks on Black Studies and hear sort of your take on how we can sort of learn from that, be in solidarity of that, but also how what's happening in Canada is very much in conversation and not sort of distinct from the kind of attacks on Black Studies programs in the US and other places. Thanks. Yeah, Look, I think, you know, the, the, even in the context of the US, the attack on Black Studies is not equally destroyed. Right, <laughs> the attack is happening in very particular kinds of places. So on the one hand, you've got a number of state schools and, and what's happening in Florida in particular and, and a number of other places where you know, the attack is, the attack on black studies is tied to an, an attack on DEI. And of course, that's something that we have to be attentive to, but you know, the IVs are not engaged in an attack on, 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 on black studies in the same way. So because that attack is not equally distributed, we're also seeing, we, we have to be attuned to the fact that there's a certain kind of rearrangement going on here. And, and, and part of that rearrangement, if we're honest, is also about um, a moment in the last decade where we've also seen a reassertion, even though they're not using that language, of a particular kind of talented tent. And I think that cascades into places like Canada, where through DEI and EDI language, there is also the production of a certain kind of talented tent. And we have to be, you know, and, and that's what I was gesturing to when I say, you know, talk about people getting awards and these kinds of things. That's a sorting and an arrangement of what becomes legitimate and what's not. And so, you know, the kind of way that I talk or the kind of things that I say uh, are not going to be the kinds of things that people want up in the president's suite, right? Because I'm, if I'm saying that, you know, I want to end liberal humanism, <laughs> the university is the bastion of liberal humanism. The president doesn't want me to end his job. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I don't take that lightly, but, but I think in terms of very seriously, the attack on black studies is in part because we know that a radical black studies means to rearrange the entire 
prospect of how we do social relations. And you know, since the 60s, um, the right wing conservatives and now the neo fascists have been consistent in waging a low intensity warfare on anything that came on, on any of the partial wins of the 60s. Um, it's, it's not coincidental. Women's studies departments are institutionalized in university, but feminist studies is not. Right? <laughs> feminist studies are under attack too. Trans studies is under attack. You know, trans people themselves are under attack, right? When Jordan Peterson emerged as that figure from the last university that I worked at, he, he, he emerged by first attacking trans students, but very quickly his attack went to women's studies, ethnic studies, African studies, and so on. All of these interdisciplinary studies emerged out of the potential 60s revolution. And by 2020, when we were locked down, and everyone saw the spectacular murder of George Floyd and people took to the street. That was another potential moment that got very quickly dissipated through EDI and DEI rhetoric and practices. So again, a sorting <clears throat> happened and a sorting happened by elevating particular black people into spaces that then could be used to demobilize more radical demands. And so this is what we're, this is what we're dealing with continuously over and over again. And so, you know, being within and against in terms of the university and in terms of knowing, you know, the geography in which you, from which you operate is about making sure that the kind of black studies you do is never wholly colonized by the institution, um, that you become accountable to a wider range of spaces, peoples and communities. I, I would just add that one thing that didn't come that you didn't have a chance to mention in the paper, if I remember correctly, is you used the term George Floyd dividend mm -hmm. to talk about the kind of rewards that a black elite has been able to gain after Floyd's death. And I think that ties directly into this idea of the talented 10th benefiting from it. And they're the ones who become university administrators and often are the ones who are breaking strikes at universities <laughs> or dismantling <laughs> black studies programs. And so we have to deal with the very complicated racial and class project here after after George Floyd. My brother had a question. Thank you. Um, uh, super amazing to meet you. I think we curated the same artist once, Raquel Rowe. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I think my main question is with regards to um, the Black general masses and just like this um, what has been posed and is to some extent just the privilege of being in an institution and um, learning from these institutions to like articulate black life and like to connect with black people and learn about our histories and present or envision our futures. But I'm always worried about like a disconnect and like how to like best address like um, just like the general broader community, especially with like language. And um, I really don't want to um, create this like power dynamic in the sense that I'm like, this is how you should be thinking and this is what you should be moving towards. But like, it's always, how, how, does, how does one like undertake these projects? I'm always thinking about like how to amass people and how to like get people who are not interested in like, um, academia in this sense or like do not want to align with the institution in any way to like think about these things and also not to like look at people in the institutions with like irreverence or like contempt or um, another another word is like um, so much like people who have so much glory how to like just like see us as humans like them working towards the same struggle and I guess um, in addition to that question I'm also interested in like the after um if we're thinking about like what comes after this liberation or if this is something that we're building as we are like um undertaking these processes and moving towards like liberation and emancipation as you say so yeah yeah i mean one one thing i i would say, one thing I would say is you know when i gesture to saturday schools that's a, a larger formation like one of the th one of the successful things of having black studies institutionalized is that it then gave the appearance that the place that you come to learn about blackness and black life is the is the university 
But prior to Black studies being institutionalized, the reason people can make that argument is because, you know, Black communities in North America and the Caribbean had vast networks of people studying and thinking and writing and publishing books and essays and conferences and meetings and so on that were outside of university institutions, Pan-African conferences, um, Black Saturday schools. You know, when I was a kid growing up in Barbados, I, I started, you know, when you begin to do some of this work and now I'm getting old or I'm old, you know, one begins to do a certain kind of memory work. You know, I was born in 1965 in Barbados. Where this becomes independent the year after that. By, by the time I'm 10 or 11 years old, um, Barbados is in the height of both figuring out its kind of national identity, but also um, in doing that, um, a kind of quixotic return to Africa. I used to go to this Saturday school called the Yoruba Dance Troupe, which was about more than dancing, right? It was a kind of school where we were being taught Black histories of the Caribbean, um, you know, a very skewed history of the West Coast of Africa, all of this kind of stuff, right? And what, what I'm saying is like, there were all of these spaces where people did knowledge making and knowledge mobilization and so on outside the university that continue to live with us and live in us. In fact, what, 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 what a neoliberal black studies can do is it can colonize black knowledge making as though the only legitimate place for black knowledge making is the university. And again, you know, depending upon how you understand what it is you're doing, that's part of what you refuse, right? You refuse the idea that the only legitimacy in terms of black studies is whether or not you're publishing in transition journal or even, right? That, 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 that there are other ways to be legitimate in black studies, like when your community calls you and say, look, we need you to come down here and talk to these five, 10 kids about whatever, and you show up because, you know, that's, that's the work that, that you do. So, you know, black studies is not just an orientation to the university as an institution and, and its own, own system of reward. It's, it's, it's about being a part of a larger political community with a, a particular kind of political imaginary that points towards something like freedom. And that something like freedom is both felt in the moment and a much larger project about transforming the infrastructures of our social relations. I, I would only add to that, that you're a perfect example of this because if you look at your CV, the majority of the writing, especially from the 80s through the 90s, none of it is behind a paywall. It was in journal, it was in artist run center journals and it, it was in other type of places and Black Like Who and most of your other publications have been through independent presses. Yeah, and not I've only published presses. one book with an academic press. Right. <laughs> and we're told not to do that, right? But but Ronaldo's work reaches more people than, than most scholars. There's a question here. Thank you so much. Um, I have so many questions. I'm going to try and see if I can put it in one. It's got to be one. because I know I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> so um, my name is Lorato and I guess in this capacity I served as the chair for the Blackness Committee for our anti-racism task force here at UBC. And just being here today, I just am so grateful because these are the kind of things we were imagining when we were working on the task force to start having this course around Blackness and leading to um, formation of Black studies. I guess my question is around placing it here, with, moved by your, your comments at the start around local geography and where you're based and placed, uh, and thinking about Black studies and conceptualizing around that. Um, the Black community in Vancouver has been displaced several times over and is reforming and re-emerging. And I think that's used by the institution as a, an indication that we don't have the critical mass for enrollment, which drives right the value of the program from the institution's perspective um, of, of Black students who would take the programs. In addition to that, I'm just thinking, how do we build pedagogies of solidarity between movements where we know in BC place-based indigeneity is really important? Are there opportunities to grow um, that, that solidarity? And then I know it's three-pronged. And then the <laughs> last part is just really thinking about how we build the movements within the university as a professional Black staff 
you know, often not included in thinking about what Black studies will look like for a Black community um, at the university. Students and faculty are often really engaged in those conversations. How do we build it so it is actually community grown, including very low numbers that we have of Black population and the institution? I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah, those are, those are really big questions. Um, but I, I think the first around thinking about you know, I mean, the story of Black Vancouver, of Black British Columbia, it's exactly that story, uh, Canada knowing all too much about Black people, but denying that they don't know anything about Black people, right? So, you know, there's that moment in, in um, Lament for a Nation, um, Grant's, in Grant's book, where he, he writes something like, um, Canada can't become the US with its black racial problem, riots and so on. Um, he's writing in the 60s, 70s. In that, in that moment, he tells the story of Canada and his, and his own um, racial paranoia. And so, you know, the question is not one of numbers. The question is one of how the liberal humanism that produces the subject called white Canadian uh, understand its relationship to, to black people. Like, you know, a black, black studies can, can exist and should exist regardless, or to use that black phrase, irregardless of <laughs> whether or not, you know, there are a million black people or 30, right? The kind of question is, is the question of, of, of knowledge and what we want knowledge to do. And so, so there's that. But again, you know, in terms of, you know, the question of community and, and how faculty and students, of course, faculty and students need to understand themselves as members of communities. That, you know, when you enter the institution, you're not entering and acting as though you're a free agent inside UBC or U of T or University at Buffalo. You are a member of a community. Um, and, and everything that conditions um, the social relations of that community actually condition your experience inside the institution itself. Like, you know, um, the way in which you get police walking down Robson Street is not very different from how you're going to get police on this campus. So if you, if you can't make those links, then there's, there's something going on that, um, that needs an adjustment so to speak. But the more radical project is, what kinds of demands do you want to make on the institution to transform itself, right? And to me, that's what Black Studies um, is, is about. It's about making institutions on demand to transform itself so that by the end of that transformation, it can't imagine what it would have been, right? You give the institution back to itself in a way that it literally cannot recognize itself. If we're not engaged in doing that work, then we're really just simply shoring up the institution. Uh, and, and the Black studies that I'm interested and in, invested in and that I've learned from Sylvia Winter about is one that is about transforming the institution so that it can be other than it is we end up with different kinds of institutions. You know, the black studies that I'm invested in is one where the university, as we know, it comes to an end. Another university now, a different university, a different kind of university. Well, before the university comes to an end, our wonderful <laughs> talk today has to come to an end. And I, I really want to thank, obviously, everyone in the audience, and I apologize for those whose questions weren't, uh, weren't asked, but a, a, a huge round of applause for uh, our thank you. Thank you so much for coming today. And of course, I also want to thank our interlocutor, Dr. Peter James Hudson, and my amazing colleague, Dr. Walcott, for helping us to think about the amazing and important and difficult work of the institution transforming itself. So thank you so much for coming today. And thank you to our speakers.